Next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about how we do church. Um, I just think it's kind of helpful to all get on the same page about how, how and why we do church, plus that's basically what I have studied for the last couple of decades. And this morning, we're talking about we are driven, and we are going to get to the Scripture, but it's at the end of the sermon instead of at the beginning. I was explaining to the uh, staff this week, I usually embed the sermon or the scripture in the sermon instead of leading it. Uh, that's prob- probably because I learned that <clears throat> many preachers preach from the text, far away from the text, if you know what I mean. So I try to incorporate it in. We are a driven nation. We are a driven people. Many things drive us. Uh, the drive to succeed, the drive to accumulate wealth, uh, the drive to attain power. Uh, We are very driven to be safe and comfortable. But one of the things we do that's one of my favorites, and you'll hear me talk about this a lot, is our drive to get more stuff. We just love to get more stuff. And we get so much stuff that we can't even put our cars in the garage because our garages are full of our stuff. Anybody, Anybody, come on, confess. And what I love is that after we filled our garage in our basement, we go rent space for our stuff, so that we can go visit it every once in a while. And I've been around a long time, and I've, I don't know why we do that, because I figured out that what happens is after you die, your kids take your stuff, put it in a yard sale, and sell it for almost nothing. So why do we work so hard on accumulating stuff? What drives us? Why do we do that? Well, we have to also ask, what drives you? Now, I have to admit that, you know, what gets me up in the morning sometimes is the alarm clock and a cup of coffee, but really there are things in our lives that motivate us. People talk about stress as if it's a negative thing. And most psychiatrists will tell you if we didn't have any stress in our lives, we wouldn't get anything done. So stress is okay. The question you have to ask is, what do you invest your time and your money and your talents in? I have said for years, if you'll show me your checkbook and show me your calendar, I can tell you what's important in your life. And for many of us, if you'll go home today and and, and study through your checkbook or your charge account and take a look at your calendar, you might be surprised at what you're investing in. It may not be what you want to be investing in. Well, churches are driven. About 20 years ago, a California pastor named Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Church, and it was probably the most influential book for churches written in the last couple of decades. And what I like about it is it's not about program and it's not about theology. You don't have to agree with Rick Warren's theology, which is good because I don't agree with anybody's theology, and occasionally I don't agree with my own theology, so... But it's about process and philosophy. Another thing I like about it, it's not a how-to book. You know, we preachers are always looking for the how-to book. If I can find the right book that tells me how to do church right, I can come and just lift that information out and use it at my church, and my church will do great. Well, it's not a how-to book. It's more of a why-do book. To ask the question, why do we do what we do? You see, every church is purpose-driven, like it or not, realize it or not. We are driven even if we don't understand what it is that drives us. And there are several things, and I'm certainly not going to give you an exhaustive list of things that could drive us. Tradition, programs, money. Members, needs, power and significance, and fear. And most of those are not bad things. Uh, Tradition's not bad. Programs aren't bad. Members aren't bad. But none of those should be driving the church. They're not the key element. They're not the central issue or the motivation. But we as churches have a tendency to drift off of the key element and drift into that. 
sermon I'm going to preach in a couple of weeks is entitled, obviously, How to Keep the Main Thing the Main Thing, because we have a hard time with that. For example, traditions. Now, we Protestants, we love to look down our noses at the Catholics because of all of their traditions, and we don't have traditions. Oh, yes, we do. We just don't write them down. Trust me as a new kid on the block. I'm discovering your traditions by breaking them and being told, oh, we don't do that. Really? I didn't know. I always love disciple churches because they'll tell me, you know, that's not what disciples do. And I always say, no, that's what your church does. Every disciple's church is very different from one another. We have them and... They probably began for a good reason, but sometimes the reason went away, but the tradition stayed. We have to look at that. Read of a Lutheran pastor that told the story that he moved to a, a, a new church. It was an old church, but new to him. And he noticed within a month that on that side, third pew back, there was a seat no one sat in. And he would start thinking about that and thought, well, I bet you it's because some saint of the church used to sit there and, and just to honor them, nobody sits in that seat. But he wasn't sure that was the right answer, so he started asking around. He says, how come nobody sits in that seat? And every person said, I don't know, but I know not to sit there. So he finally went and talked to one of the older members that was in the nursing home, and when he was visiting with her, he said, by the way, you know, I notice people don't sit in that particular pew. Why is that? And she said, oh, that's easy. About 55 years ago, we had a leak in the roof, and that's where we put the bucket to catch the water. <laughs> oh, sit there and laugh at that one. I'll bet you we got some here that are just as funny, but we don't know it yet. Sometimes the church is driven by programs. You know, it's hard, it's difficult to start a new ministry. Oftentimes churches set up so many hoops to jump through and so many barricades that by the time you finally get an okay to do a ministry, you've lost interest in it. So sometimes it's hard to start a new ministry. But it's even more difficult to end a ministry. Uh, I, most of the churches I've been called to serve when I first came there, they were small, and without fail, they would tell me, Pastor, we're so glad you're here, and I used to think that was good. It wasn't, because they thought I was going to fix something. They would tell me, Pastor, we're so glad you're here, because the women's group, the CWF, is just dwindling away, and you need to fix that. Well, back then, I was young, young and dumb. Fortunately, now I'm old and dumb, but I was young and dumb then and started working on it, trying to fix the CWF. And I became what I now call a pumping pastor. I'd run over and try to pump up the CWF. And while I'm over there pumping away, trying to get that CWF in good shape, invariably somebody come tap me on the shoulder and said, Pastor, did you notice the choir, the attendance isn't good in the choir? And I'd say, oh, hold on, ladies. And I'd run over and start pumping up the choir. And I spent all my time running around pumping things up and really getting nothing meaningful done. And one of the things that we struggle with as a church is to understand and we need to ask the question, is this what God wants us to do today? It may have been what God wanted us to do back in 1950 or 1960 or 1970 or 80 or, or even last year. But is that what God wants us to do today? Can we let a ministry die a natural death? Something else that motivates churches is money. You know the church is driven by money. If... if at the board meeting, I'm going to my first board meeting today, and I told the people in the WOW service, I said, you pray for me. I'm going to my first board meeting, and then I repented. I said, no, you pray for the board. You really need to pray for the board, because I'm going to show up. But at a board meeting, if somebody suggests we do something, 
And the first question is, how much will it cost? We are a money-driven church. Now, we're funny about money. And I mean not funny, ha-ha, I mean funny, peculiar. We're funny about money because when money starts running low, we start cutting costs, cutting back on what we're doing. Let me just be flat honest with you. It's almost, the problem with money in the church is almost never wild spending. It's poor giving. So we need to work on the giving if money is a, is a deciding factor. You see, instead of asking the question, how much will it cost? That's the wrong question. It's not a bad question, but it's the wrong question. If someone brings a ministry up, do you know what the right question is? Is this what God wants us to do? That's the right question. And if the answer is yes, it's what God wants us to do, the money will come. Notice how quiet it gets when I talk about money. Suddenly I feel like I'm preaching to a mural. It's okay, folks. We'll live through this. Member needs. Go to, a, go to a new church, never fail. They would say, Pastor, we're so glad you're here. Every time I hear that, I, I don't know how many hundred of you people have said to me, Oh, Pastor, we're so glad you're here. And I'm thinking, Oh, no. They think I'm going to be able to do something. I've worked really hard at lowering expectations since I've gotten Haven't I? Haven't I? I've done a good job, haven't I? Lower those expectations. But I would come and people would say, Pastor, you need to go visit all the inactive members and get them back. And I have discovered that that's got to be number one on my list of waste of time. Because, you know, they decided not to come because they decided not to come. And they're adults, and they can make those kind of decisions. We can't do something. Here, if, 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 if this is a statement. We can't do that because so-and-so may not like it. I don't know how to break this news to you, but I am not the least bit interested in making you or anyone unhappy. But I can do it. I'm comfortable with that. Because the correct question is not whether you and I will like it. It's, is it what God wants us to do. And I've been amazed in my lifetime how many things God has called me to do. I didn't want to do them. And I wasn't comfortable with them. The need for power and significance often drives a church. Fear drives a church. I want to tell you that as an individual and as a church, if you make any decision motivated, motivated by fear, you've made the wrong decision. The most often repeated command from God in the scripture is fear not. Obviously, he's had to repeat it to us several times because we are a fearful people. And we live in a fearful time for the church. This past week, I was reading a blog by the... Uh, chaplain at Southern Methodist University, and he just put it out there. He said the Methodist church is imploding. Well, what he really meant was every mainline denomination is imploding. I've been a disciple all my life, and in my lifetime, I've watched the disciples go from 1.5 million members to just above a half a million. I would say we're imploding, wouldn't you? And what happens when, that, when we start to see that, our first reaction is fear. We cannot be motivated by fear. We cannot make godly decisions out of fear. I want us to do the opposite. I want us to fear not. I mentioned in staff meeting, I said, don't ever not do a ministry because you're afraid it'll fail. Because my belief is that as a, as a staff, if we're not failing on a regular basis, we're not trying. 
Ministers are oftentimes afraid that someone will get mad, not like them, or they'll be asked to resign. That was one of the things I struggled with in God's calling me to the ministry. And I made a deal with God. I said, God, if I ever get to be one of those ministers that lives in fear that somebody's going to be mad at me or they might fire me, do me a huge favor and just strike me dead. Because we cannot move the church forward from a stance of fear. Our basic direction is how we are driven. What is our purpose? Church people tell you now, church leaders, that there's basically two kinds of churches. Maintenance churches, missional churches. And 90-something percent of our churches are maintenance churches. And that is we work hard, we spend a lot of resources on maintaining the building, maintaining the program, and maintaining the membership. And those churches are dying at a rapid rate. There's another bunch of churches that are missional churches. And their interest is outward focused. And those churches are growing. I've said it already here. I'm going to say it until you repeat it with me. The church exists for the people who have not yet come. The church does not exist to make you and me happy or comfortable or to meet our needs even. That's not why the church exists. The church exists is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with our community. That's why we exist. I've got some huge news for you. And this is really important. I'm, I kid a lot, but this is really important. This, you need, probably need to write this down. God's basic purpose for your life is to conform you to the image of Christ. He'd been in that process in my life for pretty close 50 years. And I can tell you personally, God is not the... God loves me. God loves you with a passion. He loves you profoundly. And he doesn't give a hoot and a holler whether you're comfortable or happy. What he wants you to be is conformed to the image of Christ, whatever that takes. One of the things that I'll repeat to you over and over again is if you're really, really comfortable, you're not where God wants you to be. Because we grow only when we're outside of our comfort zone. That's just a truth. That's just a fact. So, are we going to be inward focused? Any group that hangs around together any amount of time becomes inward focused. Every church I go to will tell me we are such a friendly church. And they are to each other. Went to my brother's church when he was in Indiana. He told me about this wonderful church. and Everybody was just so friendly. Went to the church, sat third pew from the back, went out, stood in the narthex till it, it was completely empty. Not one single person spoke to me. But boy, they were friendly to each other. We become inward focused. And it's hard work to turn around. Have you ever thought about, here's, here's some, some ideas for you. People said, you know, we don't have as big a crowd as we used to. How about you bring somebody? You know, it's not somebody else's job to get a crowd here. How about you bring somebody? Don't just invite them, bring them. How about on Sunday morning when you get here, you don't spend your time and energy visiting with your friends, but you spend your time and energy looking for someone you don't know to greet them and talk to them. As my mother would say, son, you've quit preaching and started meddling. You're in trouble. 
I believe that if, if we as a church become driven by God's purpose, we're going to look a lot like the New Testament church. And that's my scripture this morning. In Acts, the second chapter, we read about the birthday of the church. Picking it up with the 38th verse, we read this, You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. That's us. We're mentioned in Scripture. We're the ones who are far off into the future. What's the first thing he tells us? That God has the gift of the Holy Spirit for us. With many other words, Peter warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Not a bad altar call. Not a bad day. So then it goes on and says how they did church. This is how they did church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. That's how they did church. Church was not an activity in their lives. Christianity was their lifestyle. And we read what happened. It says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I believe God's purpose for this church is for us to live Christianity in such a way that we have favor with people. And they are attracted daily into the kingdom of God.